Hi, good morning, everyone. I am coming to you today from the offices of the Trust for Public Land in Bozeman. I'm making my way across the state looking at amazing recreation, the amazing recreation amenities that we have in this state. And um, we're going to get a little bit deeper into that today in an extremely exciting presentation and inspiring. So today we're going to look at um, the importance of unlocking the power of nature, some of the challenges um, to accessibility and inclusion in nature. We're gonna look, we're gonna talk with some guests about their uh, experiences, their inspiration, and their innovative techniques for allowing folks who have challenges in accessing Montana's lands and water um, to get out there and get outdoors. So today we have uh, AJ Williams, who is at the University of Montana. She's a content creator and a social documentarian. She'll be our, our lead to sort of set the stage. Next, we have Peter Powells from Camp Bullwheel in, hello. And then we have Steve Smith from Hydro Logistics. And each of them will share with you their perspective and innovative techniques for increasing accessibility. Next, uh, just a little um, keeping here and I'm gonna start my timer. Um, so uh, what we do is we will have each of our speakers uh, present. We will have questions at the end. If you have questions, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen and we will review those and answer those. If you're having technical difficulties with this getting on Zoom or sound or something, you can text your issue to 406-200-8. Two four zero next. So the key takeaways for today are is that we're going to really explore why access to nature is important. We're going to go beyond academia, and we're going to go to on the ground real examples of how, why, and where folks are getting out and enjoying nature. We're gonna look at some of the key challenges and barriers to having access to Montana's high quality recreational access for all abilities. And like I said, we're gonna really look at Made in Montana, inspiring and innovative approaches, technologies and programs that are unlocking the power of nature for all. Next. Uh, I'm the series host. I convene people that I find fascinating on topics that I find fascinating. Um, and in this time of desperately needing to get outdoors and experience nature and experiencing nature, um, I found that it's often difficult for us to connect either with good information, good stories, good inspiration. So I created this webinar series to help us do that. We record the webinars and make them available on the website, Montana Access Project. And we welcome your, your input for follow-up if we need to. Next. I start with this slide every time because this is why we're here. Um, outdoor recreation is at the center of economic vitality, quality of life and health and wellness. It is a major driver of our economies, not just tourism, but also um, the, the um, businesses that locate. Now in the time of, of COVID, we have remote workers who are able to work remotely and, um, and work where they wanna live and play. Um, in terms of quality of life, we have studies that show that even more than police protection and schools, developed access to nature is critically important in decisions that folks make to stay, live, work, and play in their communities. 
And finally, health and wellness. And that's what we'll sort of dive into today is how important getting outdoors is for mental health, physical health, and uh, overall um, wellness. Next. So we, and in the Path Ahead webinar, we focus on what we call the keys to successful outdoor recreation. Um, from engagement to planning to design to construction to funding. Today's episode will focus mainly on inclusive access and partnerships, both the infrastructure that's needed to level the playing field for, for all abilities to get outdoors and actually looking at the tools and techniques that um, are required to, to do that as well. Next. So it, study after study after study is coming out and we have cited a few which are in the, in the um, resources at the end, but it, it is clear that both green and blue spaces, and I had to, I, I have my research, uh, researcher <laughs> extraordinaire, Rachel here, um, we worked together to do a little bit of research to, to lay the groundwork for this presentation. Green spaces, we know what they are. Trees, grass, flowers, plants, and blue spaces are vistas of oceans or water. So both of those types of access to nature visual, visually and physically is, is linked to cognitive benefits, improvement in mood, health, well-being. We all know it anecdotally, but like I said, study after study after study is coming out. Uh, there was a, a study in England that found that there that the, that sweet spot is around to, to really see health benefits is 120 minutes per week. It doesn't have, all have to be at one time. You don't, it doesn't have to be warm or cold or nice. Just being outdoors will increase uh, capacity. And it, it, the, the study was, was pretty interesting. Um, there was another study that took um, veterans on river trips and there were two river trips. One was um, in California and another was a multi-day trip on the Green River in Utah. And they did cognitive analysis and found that, that be, being on the water and being on these trips resulted in a 29% reduction in, in PTSD syndromes. And again, these are snapshot studies, but um, the article that we included that, that summarizes the study is really pretty interesting. The, the, the thing that, um, I don't have it in front of me, but the, um, the thing that they note is that more than just being outdoors, it's awe, A-W-E, awe. Awe is the, the quality, just being overwhelmed by the beauty or power of nature is the most healing type of experience in, in getting outdoors. And then another study found that there's a, that, you know, memory, performance, attention span. I, uh, you can read this study again, but um, they did, they did one of these studies, they had folks do a cognitive test and then look out the window. One of them, one group looked at an asphalt roof and one looked at a, a green roof with flowers on it. And there was a huge input uh, it, it, um, improvement in the folks that looked at the green roof over the um, asphalt roof. I, I thought it was kind of a remarkable how much their cognitive ability improved. Um, next slide. So there are all kinds of groups. This is not an exhaustive list. We just put a couple of, of key partners here who are working hard to get unlocking the power of nature for all abilities. Um, we have we have in Montana, we're featuring today Camp Camp Bullwheel, but in you know, in Whitefish, we have Dream Adaptive, and there are folks across across the state that are inspiring and inspired to really unlock the power of nature for all abilities. Next. 
what I wanted to focus on today also is sort of we have this is sort of beyond the Americans with Disabilities Act. I mean, we have this precedent setting legislation that creates requirements. But what I wanted to focus on today is the innovation and the I keep saying the word inspiration, but I just it's, it's the one that comes to me because I find these I find these programs so inspiring. Um, it, it's it's going above and beyond the ADA. How do we innovate? How do we create um, technologies? How do we create adaptive fishing equipment? How do we create a, adaptive boating equipment? Uh, it's not easy, um, but it's really important. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to AJ, and she's a social documentarian, and she's working to document um, social and environmental change for, for all of us. And she's going to talk a little bit about her approach, her background, and um, share her, her thoughts and her experience for what she wants to convey with through filmmaking, the very powerful imagery of, of filmmaking. So with at AJ, if I left anything out, fill it in. Hi, everyone. Um, and we can hit the next slide. I'll just get get straight into it. Um, so like Diane said, my name is AJ. Um, I use they and she pronouns. And um, I identify in a few different ways. So I'll just kind of go through them. But I'm a disabled outdoor recreator. So I don't identify as an athlete. Um, but I do love to hike backpack, bike, and get on the water in any way that I can. And I'm also uh, disabled and live with a chronic illness that affects my heart, my lungs, and my mobility. And um, that's also made me a kidney transplant patient. So I'm 11 years post-transplant and doing great. And I'm also originally from the, mess, uh, the Rust Belt of the Midwest, um, right on Lake Michigan. So that's where you know our environment was planned and shaped by decision makers in the last century who valued it primarily as a natural resource. So that's really shaped the way um, initially that I understood environment. And yeah, so the Rust Belt, you know, meaning our skylines are covered with century old factories that were fueled and, you know, fueled the industrial revolution. So what we call front country access out here in the West, I know back home is just getting out in nature. And what that means to me is walking along the lakes and local parks and marshes that Chicago is built on. So this is so this is all what outdoor recreation me meant to me until I went to college and then I started hiking around Wisconsin and exploring backpacking. So my background is in social documentary film, as well as public radio and television these days, and I'm also a graduate student uh, for environmental science journalism at UM. And here I hope to learn how to better communicate environmental issues and solutions to the public. I'm also interested in how we can better incorporate media and storytelling into collaborative conservation work. So I'm also pursuing a certificate in natural resource conflict resolution through UM's law school here. And we can go to the next slide. So I learned advocacy through a variety of avenues. First and foremost, um, through my youth. So I was a part of an advisory board for the pediatric hospital that I went to when I was in high school. And we worked with an architect to design what was known as the Sky Garden um, in the Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And it was a 10,000 square foot hypoallergenic glass box garden that helped patients feel like they were outside when they physically couldn't be, which was critical as someone who experienced that myself. Um, I can't tell you like the benefit or I can't even describe it. Um, but yeah, it ended up primarily being a by bamboo forest with water features and tree canopies. And um, that was just a really incredible process to be a part of. I also learned advocacy from experiencing prejudice as a chronically ill person. Um, like I said, when I was first exploring backpacking and hiking in college, um, I was told that, you know, I was trying to join trips that just weren't appropriate for my needs and that I was holding others back by trying to go on them. And I was encouraged to lead trips that were quote, you know, at my level. Um, so I went ahead and I, I did that. And I learned that, you know, by organizing my own trips around people's needs in ways that brought the group safely to growing edges um, on hikes and other things like that, it, 
it made it a growth experience and a connection experience for everyone who was involved, no matter what their abilities were. And yeah, create, so outdoor access is essential for our health, like Dan was saying, both physical and mental. Um, it's even prescribed as a treatment for people with health issues across the board. Park RX is gaining a lot of momentum and it's been critical for my own health and recovery, like I mentioned. And I really admire the work like Diane, uh, that people like Diane are doing around the country to make the outdoors accessible for everyone. And so creating equitable access is community care. Um, so I use that word equity because it emphasizes meeting the needs of someone in a way that's appropriate for them. Because what works for one person or one community isn't necessarily gonna work for everyone. So this may be a contentious example, but um, I think about e-bikes. So like banning e-bikes for everyone, um, you know, that it, it doesn't work, right? So it does make a trail accessible for those who really need quiet spaces, especially people who live with PTSD, um, but not for those, you know, who, who need pedal assist to be able to navigate the trails. And so is there a way to consider you know, figuring out what, what would be appropriate that would allow pedal assessed bikes as well as, you know, keep that quiet space for people to both enjoy the trail together. So solutions like that, um, I think, you know, really create accessible access and are part of community care to make sure that everyone uh, can enjoy a trail space, um, you know, or has access to a trail that they can do that with. So slide three. So for my master's of environmental science journalism at UM, I'm working on a documentary about disability access and outdoor recreation. So this project was inspired by a statistic that one in four US residents lives with a disability, which means that access for people living with disabilities affects every kind of person from every walk of life in every community in every place. So it's gonna be a 30 minute documentary that will follow disability access advocates and their stories stories to try to demonstrate the spectrum of disability requiring improved access to and normalized representation in outdoor recreation. So like I say on the slide, um, and as someone, you know, I've learned a lot from professional athlete and DEI strategist Vasu Sajitra says, access is love. So I believe that creating access is to create a culture of care, listening, and love. And my hope for this project is that it inspires a conversation about outdoor, outdoor access within every person and that they bring that conversation back to their community. It's recognizing that our communities are stronger and that we all personally benefit from living in communities that prioritize the health of one another and each other. So that's me. I'm, I'm muting myself. Um, well, AJ, we have I, I we have quite a few. Um, you 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 were quick. Um, we have a little bit more time. Um, maybe what we'll do is we'll proceed and then we'll sort of have a Q and A and a and a discussion. Um, maybe involving all of of the advocates when we're when we're done here. So with that. Um, let's next slide. Um, I, I, before I introduce Peter, I, I just want to say I was I um, was struck by AJ because I think um, I think that having the voice and having um, the a documentary that demonstrates increased access is a really powerful tool, and especially now. Um, when there are challenges, not only in getting outside, but challenges in keeping up with information and, and, and places and uh, keeping up with the COVID, right? But, uh, keeping up with, with the guidelines that are changing constantly. Um, it's, it's just a really powerful tool. So, so we'll hear more from AJ. Um, our next guest is, is Peter Powell's, and I will let him um, introduce himself a little bit, but he is a uh, co-founder and director and guide extraordinaire at Camp Bullwheel, um, which is a, an amazing resource for folks who um, want to get on the water and fish both. So not just water access, but water access and fishing. 
Um, they have a remarkable facility that I will let him discuss and picture speaks a thousand words. So with that, uh, Peter, I will turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Nice to be with you. I'm going to share my screen and uh, then I'll have a few things to show you. So hit a few buttons here. Okay, things are coming up. Come on, take it there. Okay, so I'm hoping that everybody can see this. And um, I'm Peter Pauls with Camp Bull Wheel, just south of Ennis, Montana on the Madison River. We're a camp for people with disabilities to come and fish with their chosen companions. Since we're in a remote area, uh, it can be difficult and time consuming to get here. And then once you're here, if you have a disability that requires uh, special needs, it can be difficult. So we're trying to overcome those challenges at Camp Wheel and help people to be in a remote, high quality area and have what they need to enjoy it. So um, this aerial slide, I hope you can see my cursor. I am circling our small two acre lot where we have Camp Bull Wheel. We have a small ranch house that is wheelchair accessible. It has 32 inch wide doors on the inside and a roll-in shower. So when someone gets to camp, they can stay for a couple of days because it may take you all day to drive to where we are in the Madison Valley. And we host many people from all over the country. So in some situations, people are coming from the East Coast or the West Coast or the South, and it may take them a couple of days to get here because they'll be driving an adaptive van. And then when they finally arrive, they need to be able to have a place where they can stay and take care of their daily needs. And we've tried to provide that. So this is a aerial photograph that I have right now. Camp is in this area. Varney Road goes down into the river bottom. I have my cursor on the Spring Creek Bridge. And then if we go across the meadow, this is the Varney Bridge, which is a very famous fly fishing destination. And it is right at the fishing access for Varney, Montana. And I'm blocking the boat ramp, but it is in that picture. And so camp is within walking distance of the boat ramp. And this is the Madison River. And the Madison River from Varney Bridge downstream braids and has many side channels. Here's the main stem. And then here is a side channel. And as you go down the Madison River, there are so many wonderful fishing opportunities. And it's a beautiful river and being able to get on that river, say if you're in a power chair, uh, can be a real fun process. So uh, we're gonna try the next one. This is our wheelchair accessible cataract. It is 18 feet long pretty big, but it can carry a heck of a load. So in this picture, there is a manual chair, but it can just as easily carry a power chair. The front bar can come off, and then we put a ramp up against it, and you can roll right on to the deck. And I'll show you more about that later. Here's a few other boats that we have. And the boat in the foreground is a standard Montana fishing skiff. And the front seat on this boat can just pop out. And anyone who can transfer can then transfer onto the front deck and then put their chair on 
another deck and then transfer into their chair and they can be in a manual chair in this boat in the foreground. In the background is two other boats and they are wheelchair accessible with transoms that fold down and become a ramp and then a power chair can even roll right into either one of those dories. Here's another close up and this picture is on the Flathead River in Montana. We do float trips all over the state, although our home float is on the Madison River. Here's one of our adaptive catarafts. We have a couple of them and they allow us to carry a big load. So you can see there is a power wheelchair with an attendant and then an oarsman, and we can even have a couple of people sitting in the back. This picture is on the Bitterroot River. Now we're down in Colorado on the Colorado River, and you can see a manual wheelchair on the boat in this one, and then a bunch of participants all sharing the day. Now we're back on the Bitterroot River in Montana, and this shows the ramp deployed to the deck of the cataract, and it makes it very easy to back right on to the boat. And then this is a slide showing the deployment of the raft, and it might be a little jerky because I'm sharing the screen, uh, but we just set up the ramp on the deck of the boat. And there you can see the ramp is now in place. And now here's a chair backing on to the boat. And these power chairs are quite heavy, but the boat is equipped to handle that type of load and it provides great access. Uh, the background of this video is Lion's Bridge on the Madison River. And this is one of the floats on the Madison River. There are four major floats on the Madison River and we hit all of them. Here's a manual chair getting on to the boat and it's just a couple of still shots. And this guy is a low quad, but he's got the power to get right up there and get on board. This is on the Bighorn River in Montana, and this was an early spring float. And here's the fish that this young man caught. Here's one of our adaptive rods. This is one of the rec therapists at Craig Rehab Hospital down in Denver. And this rod, it has a foregrip with uh, Velcro bands if you do not have really good grasp to hold on to a rod, you can use this brace rod with the Velcro straps to hold it in place. The reel is a spin cast reel. It has an extended button and it also has a built up handle on the crank for the reel retrieve. And it makes it a lot easier to operate a reel for someone who may not have good grasp. Here's another adaptive fishing rod, and this has an electric reel. And this enables somebody who can only fish one-handed to use a fishing rod. And here you can see a little close-up of grabbing the rod, and my thumb in this picture is on the switch that activates the retrieve of the rod. If you extend your index finger, you can grab this little lever. I'm putting my cursor over the lever and that controls the real release for casting. And so you can cast and retrieve with just one hand. Here's a one-handed fly fishing rod. This young man is learning how to use it. This rod has a chest plate 
and th that supports the rod. And so you only need one hand to crank and hold the rod. The rod is also removable from that chest plate and allows you to initiate a cast all one-handed. Here is a low quad rod. This enables a low quad, say a C56 to a C67, who has limited control of their arms, but maybe some wrist extension to use a spin cast fishing rod. And what this rod does is uh, has a base plate, that gray base plate slides underneath the cushion of a wheelchair. And then the gooseneck, I'll put my cursor over the gooseneck portion, puts the reel and the casting hinge right in your optimal range of motion. And I think I have, all right, here's one that is in place and this person is going to cast it. And I think we have a video of this. It might be a little jerky because I'm screen sharing, but you see he's pulling back on the rod and just lets it go. He doesn't have to control the reel because that part is automated. And now he's getting ready to retrieve it. He was handling his line a little bit and he's shortly going to hit an electric switch which will retrieve the deployed fishing bubble and the fly on the end of the bubble. And so this can be an effective fishing means for a low quad. And then a little later, this is the fish he caught. This fishing system is a fully automated fishing system for a high quad. This young man has a controller in place on his chair and it puts a quad stick controller right in front of his mouth so that he has sip and puff tubes as well as a joystick at his control. And then in that white box to the right of us is the Fishinator, which is a fully automated fishing system. And you can remotely control what that fishing system does. So with the quad stick controller, he can tell the fishinator to cast whatever distance he wants to cast to. And he can control the retrieve of whatever he casts out. And if he gets a bite along the way, he can tell the fishinator to instantly hook the fish. So the rod would go, right now it's in a forward position. He can instantly tell the rod to come up to the 12 o'clock position, hooking the fish. And it's a fully automated system. He can change the distance that he wants to cast. He can change the speed he wants to retrieve. He can change the release point when he's casting for different lures. So he has a lot of independent control. And then here's what it's all about. This is a father and daughter fishing on the Roaring Fork River in Colorado. And he is a low quad, but managed to catch this gorgeous brown trout. And uh, that is pretty much the end of my slideshow. Um, yes, that is it. So uh, if anybody would like to come to Camp Bullwheel, you can go to campbullwheel.org and you can sign up to come for a free float. You can stay at our little cabin, which is wheelchair accessible. Everything is free, shuttles, floats, lodging, 
uh, the only thing we do is split up the grocery bill. So if you can make it to the Madison Valley, uh, I know it's a long way away from many people, but it is completely wheelchair accessible, both on the boats and where you're lodged. And so you can get into a remote high quality fishery and fish to your heart's content. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I guess we can go into them later. But uh, for me right now, that's it. Amazing. Um, thank you, Peter, for sharing that. Um, I, I told my colleagues I wasn't going to use the word awesome, but I'm going to. Um, I, I just think that that the in the thing that I'm struck with is the innovation and the passion, both of folks being out on the water and the folks that are making it happen. Um, the technology is mind boggling, and it just goes to show what we can do if we if we try and and use technology to to open some of those those doors to nature. So um, thank you, Peter. Um, so we had AJ to sort of set the stage for us um, about the importance of nature and um, opening the importance of, of um, getting the word out to open those doors. We have Camp Bullwheel as an example of both technique and technology and programs and access um, to, to show how programs and places can really help open open doors and now we have steve who uh works with with camp bullwheel but i i was i actually was met by i i met steve through another um colleague vonda mcgarvey thank you vonda props to you um i i told her i was looking for inspiring stories about um folks you know all abilities and folks with special needs getting out and she said oh check out my friend steve so she sent me a um an, an art um news story about steve which we can share with you in the resources and um the rest is history so um steve is going to uh tell it, what he does which is the really hands-on um experiences that he shares with folks who need a little bit of help to get out there and enjoy it and buckle up and 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 enjoy the ride so to speak so steve i'm gonna turn it over to you i didn't really introduce you properly um but you can introduce yourself um with the marvels of um of what an expert boat person you are Oops, muted. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Okay, all right, all right, so there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna <clears throat> share here for the next 15 minutes or so, kind of my um, uh, journey to, to, what I, to what I do. And um, I, I guess what it is, is um, I, I've been, go ahead and uh, let's see the next slide, please. There we go. So I've been running. Yeah, let's make it go. So I've been running. I learned how to row Mackenzie boats on the Mackenzie River back in 1978. And since then, I've been able to row these boats from Alaska down uh, into Chile. Um, I, I love fishing, but I, I, I do enjoy big white water. And uh, this is on the Flathead River here in Buffalo Rapids. So, so some of these pictures and videos along the way are just going to be kind of what I've done through the years. But I, I did guide for 14 years up in West Glacier. And uh, one of my people I guided with up there and a good friend uh, ended up in a wheelchair after a ski accident. And after he came back from uh, real rehabilitation, we uh, were able to get an, an easy stand chair and bolt that into the front deck of his drift boat. So that dealt with that, but trying to uh, transfer him uh, into this boat was, a, he, it was a big challenge. Uh, he was a big guy. Um, it, it wasn't really amenable to lift him up. So he, he installed a, a, um, 
a crane basically on the tongue of his drift boat trailer. And the process was, is we'd at the top of the boat ramp, we, he would wheel next to the boat. We'd snatch him with this crane and lift him up out of his chair um, and then swing him into the boat and put him in an easy stand chair and then back the boat into the river and, and launch the boat. And then have to reverse that process at the end of the day. So it worked, you know, it, it picked him up and moved him into the boat. It, it was labor intensive though. It took probably three to four people just to accomplish that even with the, with the crane. And I just, you know, it attracts a lot of attention. It's unwieldy. It's not elegant. So I, I wanted a different way to do it. And I started looking at different boats, different ways to do it. And I was familiar with the Higgins boat from World War II, the, the, the landing craft boat. And I thought, geez, if we could just make a ramp that would just fold down. <clears throat> and my only really um, goal at that point was to go fishing with a buddy without a lot of extraneous things to do. So I, I start, go ahead and let's see the next um, slide, please. Um, on the next one, I guess. And so I, I started looking around and um, for, for boats that would have ramps in them. And uh, I finally designed a boat um, that I, and I gave that design to call for drift boats and they built one. There's a slide of it here um, in a little bit. And I started saving up my money so I could buy a boat of my own design. And, but uh, when I finally had the money, I, I looked around at the boats uh, that were available. The next slide, please. And, um, and Willie's Drift Boats are out of Central Point, Oregon. They've been around for a long time and they were building a boat um, that the transom, the stern would fold down and the seats would move out of the way. And then the, the wheelchair just, the chair just rolls into the boat. Or if you're just someone with some type of mobility challenge, you can walk aboard and you can walk all through the boat up to the front uh, deck without having to step over a seat or anything like that so it was a really nice boat you can configure it all sorts of different ways and um and so i ended up buying one of those boats so have the next slide please and yeah go ahead show me the next slide what the heck this is yep there's there's actually there's a camp bull wheel boat with uh domino peter and um the next slide please so this is Willie Ellingsworth. This was the guy that first started Willie's Drift Boat Company that, that we have the two boats from now. And you can see Willie had his own challenge um, with missing the, that left hand, but he, he adapted to it. He was a heck of an oarsman and uh, he built a lot of really great boats. They're still in business today. They have an excellent reputation for stability and um, the ruggedness. And so I ended up buying one of these boats and then Camp Bullwheel uh, move their boat over here uh, to my program, and I manage that boat for them over here. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is the Willie's boat. This is just above, we'll have a video of this here in a little bit, but this is a, a VA counselor from Kalispell that comes out with us and uh, provides us uh, participants to contact with. Uh, the next slide. There we go. That's a little better, better shot of it. But uh, anyway, so I, I started, uh, I, I got one of these boats, I saved my money up, uh, bought one of these boats and, 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 and I started running these trips and all I really wanted to promote this idea of like, I'm not a big program. And what I really enjoy about being outdoors is the camaraderie of it. And that's what I really tried to promote. And I love these boats because two buddies can go out fishing. It, it's about all it takes. You know, you can, you can roll some of the board. It doesn't take a lot of help. You don't have to pick them up and transfer them. They just do what they do every day and they just move into the boat. It also, these boats are very nice. Peter's boats and my boats, it's nice because they're not just stuck in the front looking forward though, that, that they, can, they can turn around, uh, fish off either side of the boat or turn around and talk to other people in the boat. And that's a really nice, um, it just, it just, um, it just incorporates them into everything everyone else does in a boat, you know, just to turn around and visit with your friends or, you know, be able to fish off one side or the other. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is, and, and again, there's just two buddies. This is out on the uh, Clark Fork River. And um, it's just two, two buddies out fishing. This is all it took was just three of us to go out. So it, it, um, I don't run a big fancy program. I, I deal a lot with local people. And, um, and, and I continue, it's not just a one-time deal. If you, need, um, if you need a ride down the river, I, let's go. I, I, don't ask too many, I don't ask any questions about what it is, why you think you need to go down the river, 
I don't have any requirements except that you tell me you want to go down the river and that's all I need to hear and, and we'll go and we'll make it work. That's the other thing I say is, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, if, if uh, we deal with veterans with PTSD that can just walk aboard or we deal with people that, you know, have a little bit more challenge and, but we don't say no, we will figure out if you want to go, uh, we'll figure out how to get you on the water. So the next slide, please. There we go. There's, I think, there, there's the, this is the boat I designed for Coughlin, and it's not a great shot of it, but it is the front of this boat. Uh, instead of the stern, the, the bow of it, it's a pram boat, so it's square on both ends. And this is a neat setup. You see that it, it um, that, that um, ramp folds down and then unfolds again. Um, this boat has a little bit lower sides to it. And that was one of the reasons I went with the Willie's boat is like, I, I know the kind of water I do. And I just thought I'm going to need a higher side boat. So I went for the more traditional uh, Willie's boat. But Koffler Drift Boats out of Eugene, Oregon does produce this boat. Um, the next slide, please. Pete, there's, there's one of Peter. We're out on a day for our own. I think that's on the Madison River. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is just some boat. This is the, the, so I should talk a little bit about, um, I named the boat. I live uh, here on the Flathead Indian Reservation. And um, I, I wanted to be involved with the community and, and have the support of the community. And uh, Private Louis Charlo was, was a local World War II hero here. And his story wasn't very well known, but he was with a squad of Marines who were the first ones up Mount Suribachi. Uh, on Iwo Jima in 1944. And he helped carry the first flag. Um, the, the, the iconic picture that you see, um, not to take anything away from those guys, but that was the second flag that was raised on Iwo Jima. Uh, Lewis was with a squad of guys that made it up there. They were the first ones to make it up there. They had a small flag that turned out to be from the USS Missoula, which is just 35 miles south of me. And uh, that was the first flag that was raised on um, on Mount Suribachi in 19, February 1944. Lewis was killed in action a few days later while he was trying to drag another friend um, back out of the field. So not a lot of people know his story. When I heard that story, I thought it was just, you know, I should promote that also. It's, I, I worked with the American Legion here in St. Ignatius and it was a great story. And that's something I try to promote is, um, you know, recognizing local heroes and, and, and remembering their story. And so it, it, I tell Lewis' story every trip I go out in this boat. So the next slide, please. Okay, this, just, this, this is from the, this is a little bit more white water. This is kind of the experience I bring to the game. And, um, and we, and I do run, we do, we, we'll, well, I will go through rapids uh, with the Willie's boat. You know, we talk to people and assess what, what they want. And, um, and, then, and then go for it. And I've, I've ran the whitewater section several times on the, the middle fork of the Flathead and, and over on the Clark Fork. So the next slide, please. And the dogs are always welcome here from the other. I've, I've got uh, my little dog comes with me all the time. This is a friend's dog that was in the boat and we're dog friendly. Uh, it's it's uh, being outdoors uh, with the camaraderie of it is quite often enhanced by a good dog in the boat. So that's what's going on there. Um, the next slide, please. And this is just a picture of the boat. It kind of shows you how, how open this boat is. All these seats remove from the boat and they, they turn to the side. Um, and so the, the chair can go up onto that elevated front deck. Um, you see, I, have, I, have, I do have tie downs for it. Both, all these boats have tie downs uh, for, for if you do need to secure a chair, but it's, it's kind of nice to let people just wander around uh, as they want to. So uh, the next slide, please. This was uh, an event over on, um, I forget the name of the lake, but Peter was there. This was um, the Empower Spinal Cord Injuries, uh, people out of Bozeman. And this was really the first time I was able to show off the boat. Uh, but you know, this is a big, it's an 18 foot boat. Um, so it does carry a big line, uh, a big load. And, um, and we just rode it around on the lake. And this, this gentleman was really wanted to row a boat. He hadn't rowed a boat since his injury. And so we put him in there and, and let him go. And he actually, I've got some pictures of him here a little bit. He came out fishing with me a few days later. I was letting him row the boat and he put me over some really nice fish. So uh, the next, please. And just, you know, it, it just wouldn't be complete without plenty of fish pictures. So there's another one over on the Missouri River. The next slide, please. And here's, here's Dan, who was in the pictures. 
the slide two slides ago and we met him at the empower spinal cord injury he lives in washington he hadn't been able he had loved rowing boats and i hadn't been able to do it and that really struck a chord in me if you if you told me i could if you gave me a choice between fishing and rowing boats uh, it'd be a hard choice for me but i would row boats and so it, it just really moved me when he said he, he hadn't rowed a boat and i and i told him so we'll we'll get you rowing a boat so that's what he did he rowed me over i, I caught I, I really the biggest smile i saw him have all day is he, he caught his fair share of fish but when he rowed me over and i caught a big rainbow trout i mean uh, the smile on his face that he was able to to row his friend and uh, able to catch a fish that's that's why i do this next please there's Matt with another rainbow trout. Next slide, please. And of course, you get to be in beautiful places. Diane talked about the uh, um, the rehabilitative and there's restorative effects of being out in nature. And this is it. I mean, look at that water and you're out with, with your friends. Eric has got a nice fish on. And this is what I really try to promote just on a local level. Um, if, if you need a day out in the water with some friends, um, you just call me up and we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll go somewhere and get you on the water and go fish. Uh, the next slide, please. The next slide, please. And there's Dan with this. There we go. And this, and of course, you know, it, it went for me, it went from, you know, people with mobility, mobility challenges, just, and we're talking now about being inclusive for everyone. And, and th this young lady came out with the Empower Spinal Cord people, she was helping them run that trip, but she really wanted to row that boat. And, um, it, and it, it was just really great. You know, I mean, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I live in Montana, I'm, I'm on the rivers all the time, I'm guiding. Um, I don't get to meet a lot of people that are outside my my uh, my circle, right? But but I mean, here here this gal came and um, she wanted to row the boat, and she had a great time rowing the boat. And uh, and you know what you learn from this is that you when you have shared interests, you can get along with anyone, right? I mean, that's I've I've been several times through my career, I've learned this lesson about you know about being able to connect with someone because they love the same thing you do, uh, even though they probably live a, a lot different day-to-day -day life. So, they, and, and this is something I really enjoy is, I mean, it's a big wide world and this is, this is, you know, it's opened it up for me also. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, more fish pictures, another slide. And again, it's just about keeping people together and letting them do, do things that everyone else does and uh, going out and having a good time. And that's, that's, that's all we try to do. It's a message is that simple. We're just, we're just out to, to have a good time to have fun. Next slide there. And that's a little bit, there we go. We finally see the ramp let down on the boat. Uh, this was in a Memorial Day parade, I think a couple of years ago, but I just wanted to show how the ramp went down and the wheelchair sits on the front deck. Uh, next slide, please. Matt, it's, it's smoky out, but we go anyway. It's kind of, and that's the Camp Bull Wheel boat that we've moved over here. And uh, my little dog there in the back. So the next slide, please. We'll just look at a couple of these as we go. And the next slide, please. There we go. And so I should say that I operate on, on the Flathead Indian Reservation and I've got an agreement with the Flathead Raft Company who has the exclusive use up here. And so through them, I'm able to, to, to run these trips and we don't charge anything of the participants, anything for these trips. So it's all covered uh, by the nonprofit. And uh, again, the Flathead River is just a beautiful place to, to do this program. It's, you know, it's nice water. It doesn't have a lot of, you know, big, big whitewater things unless you go up on the, the whitewater section, but it has several species of fish uh, that are usually pretty willing to bite. So it's a, a beautiful place to work. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide, please. Oh. There we go. Okay, this is yeah, great picture here. So this is uh, what Peter's talking. This was the same trip that Peter had some pictures of, but this shows the two Willys boats with the uh, transoms down, and we've already loaded the people in them. But um, again, this is just a great and I. I should say something about uh, the access. So the boats give access to the boat, but where I live on the Flathead Reservation, the actual access to the river is, is sometimes not great. And so that's what we really struggle with is sometimes just the last 
10 feet to the boat um, can be very bouldery and and so we have a variety of options to deal with that but um, I'm work, trying to work now with the tribe on, on um, um, making a few of these spots a little bit more accessible which would give me a, be, just be easier to, to run a few more trips on different sections of the river. So, the next slide please. Uh, this was a gentleman, he just, he, he had a, a, a little bit of a mobility issue, so he was able to walk aboard the boat, and uh, and again, had it rowed a boat for a long time, and this this is as big as this boat is, it's a very easy rowing boat, it's very well designed, and uh, and he spent about half the day rowing the boat while the rest of us finished, so, and my hard work, work my hard working dog there, so, the next slide, please. And again, this I, there's there's pictures and they're in here. And, and again, it's it's just it's about friends going out. So these two gentlemen, the 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 gentleman on the on the left, had mentored the one on the right for years about fly fishing, and um, the, he developed some mobility challenges. And we took him out in the boat. And I just I I love this picture. So uh, the next picture, please. And there you go. That that happened. So and the next picture, please. And another one. Okay, I think we might be at the end of it. Let's, let's try another slide here and see if I somewhere in here there's a video of the. Oh. Oh, is the, is that? I'm not too sure if there was. No, I think we're. I think we're. Okay. It looked like some of them were hanging up a little bit, but we're we're out of time. Okay. Um, right. I made it. <laughs> you you made it exactly. Um, I don't want to cut you off though. It's you got you didn't tell us the one that got away story. You there aren't any fish pictures. There, there aren't any fish that got away. Um, oh, there you go. Okay. No, no, there um, I, you know, I, I I would just like to add one more thing, if if I may, yeah. just, just take me a minute. As I started this process uh, to find a boat that, that a ramp would go down, um, I'm I've learned through there's all sorts of questions but when you want to do something there's two kinds of questions people ask and the, the first question is pretty much is how do I not do this and I just I don't have time for those questions anymore I don't I I want to know how we there, there, I, I, I want to deal with questions about how we do this and one of the questions I was asked the most about and, and Peter knows it's a it's a sensitive point for me but I would tell people about this boat or about the boat I just bought or they'd see the boat and the first thing they do is ask me if the boat leaks. And I spent, and, and Peter can, we can't, Bull Will bought one of these boats too. We spent a lot of money buying these boats. And I never asked if the boat leaked. I, it just didn't occur to me that someone would manufacture a wheelchair accessible boat and make it leak. So, but, it, but it's, it's funny when people ask me those questions, I'm, I, I get kind of short with them, you know, and one guy tried to back up and he, he said, well, okay, that's neat. How long have they had that technology? And I said, I don't know, since D-Day 1944, I guess. But, but I just, we don't have time for how not to do things. Those, when you hear those kinds of questions, you've got to change that conversation or just go find someone that wants to ask a positive question. And, and I've run into this, you know, I, I just got into this game because I wanted to go fishing with a friend. So I've kind of had to learn as I go, but all, all the time you meet resistance from uh, people that they just don't think it's safe or they think it's too risky. And, you know, there, there's a difference between risk and consequence and we can manage risk. The consequence certainly can be severe if you don't manage risk. But when, you know, my, my entire boat career, I've had to manage risk. And you see that I, I, I do take risks, but they're mitigated by good equipment, um, good people you're with, your experience and your ability to access, assess your own experience and whether you can pull something off. So, but it's the, um, you know, it's that positive attitude. And that's why I like doing this. I, one of the reasons I've guided for years, but when you start taking people with challenges out and they want to go do things, those are the people I want to be around. You know, that's a decision I've made for myself. But, you know, I, I, there's a certain pe kind of people I want to be around, and it's not the ones that ask, how do I not do things? So, well, that's thank you, Diane. That is a good yes. Uh, how do we do it? Not how do we not do it? So, right. we have uh, two minutes left, and I'm going to do quickly, I'm going to just mark your calendars. We do this every time. Our next episode is coming up in October. It's it's the rip. We're going to look at the ripple effect of the ticketed entry system in Glacier National Park, how people 
experienced the park, how people experienced the landscape around the park. We're going to hear the impacts on state parks, impacts on adjacent areas to the park, like the two medicine area. We're going to see where there are people in places that aren't as as a, a that doesn't that aren't built to accommodate them. It's not going to be definitive. It's going to be very anecdotal. They're not going to have their studies uh, yet, but we're going to partner with um, the National Parks Conservation Association that are dedicated to parks, and they're going to have some visitor research and some research about the ticket and entry system as our par national parks get hammered and pounded every year. It might be something that we're looking at in the future uh, for all of our national parks, but particularly the very, very visited ones that have, you know, multi-hour waiting lines to get into the park. Um, in November and December, we're going to do extra deep dives, hour and a half episodes on, um, we're going to look at federal funding opportunities. We're hearing a lot about LWCF, Great American Outdoors Act, America, uh, America the Beautiful, 30 by 30, their uh, uh, infrastructure money. So we're going to sort of do the best we can to unwind and, and make relevant to Montana how some of those opportunities, may, we may be seeing them coming down the pike. And then we're going to do the same with state. We have more money from the state. We have fully funded LWCF. We have, um, um, you know, more money in the Montana Trails Stewardship Trust, you know, stewardship fund than we've ever had before. But how do we get that money on the ground with really great inspired projects that are built to last? That's what we're going to look at. Okay, next slide, I think, is, is, the, is the last. Um, uh, if you want to get in touch with these folks, here's their information. Like I said, this episode will be posted on the website. You can either watch the episode episode, or you can watch just the presentation. Uh, get in touch with these folks and uh, open your heart to what they're offering and um, get inspired outdoors. Um, next slide. And then we have resources. So some of the studies that we referenced, um, we'll, we'll make sure um, we, you can get to Camp Bullwheel and, and um, Steve and AJ through, through their emails, but um, we will um, make sure that we have those resources available to you. Now, oh, we're over time, but I wanna ask each of you to give me a two sentence answer. Um, if you are talking to like fish, wildlife and parks, fishing access sites, what advice can you give to improve access? Forest service, whatever it is. Peter, two sentences. Um, there two are minutes. very many <laughs> yeah. ways to make accessibility and keep looking to find those ways. Okay, um, Steve? Uh, I. It's 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 an evolution of, about how fish and game uh, improves our, our access. So I, I think they just they need to look at it from someone's point of view that's in a wheelchair and has a, a hard time moving over rough ground. You know, to start looking at options, um, some creative ideas for that to improve that type of access. Okay, so, yeah. AJ. I would say that public forum um, isn't the only way that they should be trying to get advice on how to do this. I think reaching out to organizations who are doing this work as well as advocates themselves and really doing their research to find who they should be talking to is the most important thing because those people have ideas and they might not necessarily be the people who have like an hour on a Saturday to go to a public forum. There you go. Um, create networks, create spaces and work at it, not just waiting for the ideas to come to you. Do you hear that? We've got now, we've got land managers uh, usually on our websites and they certainly check it out. So um, those public land managers who make these wonderful spaces available. Um, that's great. Thank you. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, feel free to get in touch with any of us at any time. And thank you for your time and inspiration. I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Nice to be with you.